say that's the biggest compliment. <laughs> I want to say two things, sort of preparatory to what I'm doing. I've been an attorney for 23 years. Uh, I was raised in the church. You talk a lot about the church there. And uh, I left the church when I was 23. And I went through my whole career, dealt with all the things that I have dealt with over the years, and then now I'm back at the church because I determined what you determined. That every problem we have in this city, most especially that's where I pay attention, can be boiled down to violation of one or some combination of the Ten Commandments, most especially, you know, the, the, the summarization that Jesus gave about the Golden Rule. You take, the, you take that outline, put it anywhere, and if we could all do that, we'd be fine. But what is the problem with that? Nobody doesn't make money. We can't. We can try, and as, you know, followers of God, Jesus Christ, our, our responsibility is to show God's love and grace bring change to the world where we can, but the problem if you're a Christian, you understand, we can't do that. We will never be able to make the world perfectly correct. We can make it correct in lumps. And we can move toward the day when Jesus returns. And that's the only time we're going to have the world that we want. And i just like to tell you before a start, I think that's coming very soon. So people need to think about that and be ready So I say that. And the second thing that I want to pick up following people who spoke to me before as a person who's run for office a few times, worked in government, most of my, my career, it's absolutely positively true that we have the country that we want, and I mean that collectively, we want. We have the government we want. Because if we didn't want what we have, we'd change it. And before I just get a little bit into my background, I want to give you the most often question I get a lot when I'm not talking. Mr. King, why, why are the prisons overcrowded? Why are we the country in the world where we're going to do whatever the police say? It was settling the cases that need to be settled when the police really wronged somebody. Fighting the cases where the people were lying. But most importantly, having a dialogue with the police departments so that when we saw problems, we had credibility with them and they would institute changes so we wouldn't have to see these cases again. Same thing with the prisons department. Um, that's the sort of role I would, I would be in, and that's how I got to lecture in the police academy and the prison academy concerning these things. Um, and then at some point, people started fighting over the police cases, you know? Because you see the police mm -hmm. cases in the paper. You know, the police, that high-speed chase, dude gets out, they kick the crap out of him, the helicopter's taking the picture. Everybody wants that case. So I wasn't into that, and no one liked prison cases when the inmates would sue. So I said, why don't you give me the prison cases? So I became known as the prison guy, and at some point there, uh, the general counsel of the prison left, so I was it. I was general counsel of the prison, and at the time, if you're from Philadelphia, the prisons here were under consent decrees, meaning the court supervised the prison. It was always in the newspaper, so those became my responsibility. So I continued doing the police stuff, all of that, and then in December of 2002, I was sitting by myself, very depressed in the Mayfair Diner because the commissioner of the Philadelphia prisons I worked for was leaving, and I didn't know what I was going to do. You know what I'm saying? And the phone rang, and it was the commissioner, and he said, would you like to be commissioner of the Philadelphia prisons? So I said, sure. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't planned it. I hadn't jockeyed for it. I hadn't done anything. It never occurred to me. I didn't even know what I was saying yes to, really, um, once I got there. So I started in that job. And it was probably three weeks into it, in December, no, January 1, 2003, I was sitting at the House of Correction, if you're familiar with the prisons here in Philadelphia. And we have six major jails, 36,000 people go in and out of the Philadelphia prisons every year. One of the biggest jail systems in the entire world, I bet you didn't know that. And I'm sitting there in the House of Correction, and I'm, look, I'm on the stage looking out at the people, with the inmates who are sitting there in the audience. And it dawned, two things dawned on me. One, it dawned on me like in my heart. These, these folks look just like me. I mean, they're all black men. There's probably 400 men in the audience, and huh? they're all black, except for one white guy's probably over in the corner. They look just like me at various stages in my life, except they all had blue eyes, and I had a suit on. And it was, it was humbling in the sense that I realized, who was I? I was not so special that I was up front lawyer who's the commissioner of the prison. I was humbled in the fact that I was up front 
because I had two parents who were God-fearing parents who said, go to school, do the right thing, yada, yada, yada. That's where I got. That's how I got where I was. It really wasn't. I mean, I went along with the program, but it really wasn't me. And then I looked and thought about what I learned about the people who were sitting in the audience. Now, some of them had parents like mine, and they just didn't want to listen, but most of them didn't. As my wardens told me, the problem with the prisons back in 2002 to 2008, probably the same as when I was commissioner, was that the people that were looking at all the crack babies grew up, right? And their kids are the ones who are in prison. They don't. There are a lot of, you know, they just don't. They, they're just a whole different breed of people. So I was humbled. And then I thought, wow, all 8,500 people up here on the prison campus at one time, they're my responsibility. I'm supposed to take them in, make sure they're fed and all that stuff, and get their medicine and whatnot. But we're supposed to make sure they're rehabilitated. Do you understand what I'm saying? And sent back to the community. So I undertook to try and do that for the five years that I were there. We did a lot of good things, but I came to the conclusion running the Philadelphia prison system or any other pr prison system is an insane job, it's an insane assignment, and it is set up for somebody running such a system to fail. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, yes, more. Yes. it most certainly is. So I'll get back to that. Um, and then I left the prisons when Republican, but I did work with him for a while, and he did some legislation on ethics and cell phones, and then I resigned because I wanted to run for judge. And the reason I wanted to run for judge is because of all the things I saw in the prison system concerning judges not caring about how fast their cases went, judges letting parole petitions sit on the desk for 50, 60 days, all those sorts of things that caused the prisons to be overcrowded. So I ran for judge. The first time I didn't make it, that's a story I'll tell you another day. The second time I didn't make it, that's also another story I'll tell you another day. Last time I ran again, um, the way that the system worked, you know, I wasn't, a law, I wasn't a judge before I become a judge, and if for some reason you want to impeach me, go ahead, I can do something else. But anyway, so I'm keeping up with that. Um, and I do civil rights law, but now I don't represent law enforcement, I represent people who are. It's just a weird way my life has gone, I'm telling you. Uh, and so I, I work for myself. I don't have any overhead. I really don't require millions of dollars to pay my mortgage or my car payment. So I'm not really in it for, I'd like to make a million dollars. But I don't need to make a million dollars. We'll use that. So what I do now, I take a lot of cases that I feel like no one else will take. So I'll just give you a couple of, like, of examples. One, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out a way to take. And part of what this young man said about the criminal justice system, part of it is a lot of people who are, who are Violate, don't complain. And two, when they do, the problem is money. So I'll give you an example. I have a client who's a police officer. She came to me. Her aunt is in Muncie. She's been there since 1980. And as the story goes, she was in an abusive relationship. Most women who are locked up are in a, either an abusive relationship or they got into drugs because of the abusive relationship. There's some connection. And her boyfriend, somebody run a fight, she was there. And she said, shoot him. So the boyfriend shot him, and dude died. So she does life in prison. So for the past couple of years, she'd been complaining that she has aches and pains everywhere. And the doctors at the prison were ignoring her, and giving her, I don't know, aspirin or whatever. Finally, she got some sick and her outside. And they found that she had stage four cancer. Deposits of it through her body. And, you know, they had been ignoring her. We have, uh, couple letters from other inmates on the block that says, you know, basically the prison has a private uh, medical company. Basically the issue is saving money. Yeah, saving money and you're a, a, a lifer on debt, on, uh, you know, you're a lifer here at Muncie, who cares? In prison. Right? <laughs> and most of them, I'm sure, don't have a niece and a sister who are in their life paying attention trying to get something done. Hmm. So I wrote a will and did some other things for this lady, and uh, so now we're trying to figure out what we do, and what do you think the problem is? <laughs> Who's going to finance the case? Exactly. So, and in light of the fact that what? I told people when I was at the prison, there's two different types of suicide cases I could tell you about. It was a white male in one case, first arrest, worked at the uh, rectory, cleaning the whatever, doing the yard, he was a, an Irish immigrant. 
He goes in, he hangs himself, his family sued, we settled that case for 440000 that's like 20 years ago, which was a lot of money. And that's because of, you know, he had some potential in life, etc. Another case, suicide, prison was wrong, African American male, arrested 50 times, whatever it was, how much do you think that case settled for? It was a death 45, case. 17,500. Mm. And that's because there's no, you know, in a, in a, in a case, a that death case right. like that is like, you're a college student or you're a college graduate, you're a high school graduate, if you worked at this job for so long, you do X, Y, Z. So in this case, it's the same thing. She's going to die. I mean, she's, they're sending her to hospice, hospice, she's going to die. And so if I were to take the case, there's really no economic value because from a legal point of view, there's no, le there's no economic value to her life, which is a sad thing to say, but it's true. But what I'm trying to do is figure out a way that we can maybe lump all of them together and, you know, get some medical records and figure out how we can maybe pool money together because you got to hire an expert to do all sorts of things to make change. I took another case of a uh, child rapist. No one liked him. Tough luck. Uh, he raped an 11-year-old girl. You may have remembered this four years ago. He was on TV because when they caught him, they beat him with two by fours. Oh, yeah. and they took him to CFCF. Yeah. And when they got to CFCF, the COs, mm -hmm. because he spilled some orange juice yeah. on somebody's shoe, felt they should beat him to a pulp and put him in a coma for a week. And his, his, his aunt contacted me, and I took that case. And I got to get to my concluding remarks, but I want to explain why I took the case. Because as this gentleman said, we have a constitution. I'm a constitutional lawyer. The 14th Amendment and the 8th Amendment guarantee certain rights for inmates, all inmates. There's no exception for child molesters or child rapists. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the second thing is, it's a, an example of where his parents, the entire system, failed this person. He was born, he didn't ask to be born. His parents were heroin addicts, living in North Philadelphia, in and out of uh, homeless shelters, on the street, etc. When he was six years old, his mother, gets me angry talking about this, his mother would drug him up and rent him out to her male druggy partners so that he could be sodomized from the time he was sick until whenever it was. Do you understand oh, what I'm saying? Gosh. No, it's just it's getting me up. So this is why I took the case. And then his mother died. He went to live with his aunt. His aunt, not the aunt who was telling me, another aunt sat him and his brother down and said, here, here's some crack cocaine. So you know, that was 14. He was 24 when he, can, he did this. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, when I was born, my parents programmed me to be an educated person. His parents programmed him to be a rapist. That's what he grew up with. And so hearing that story, I was very angry that the CEOs would undertake to be judge, jury, and executioner of this person. And not let, so we, I sued, I got a settlement for that. And the, the uh, silver lining for that case is when he, got, when he went away, don't tell anybody this. I couldn't send the settlement to his inmate account because it's too much money. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they knew he had money in his well, inmate yeah, account, for his own cost of that's right. Every right. time he broke a broke a mug, you know, his yeah. sheet didn't work. Yeah. They yeah. So I have it in my trust account, and I send him money every so often. But we have been writing back and forth. And I went to my pastor and I said, "Well, I want like something I can send somebody who can't read that well, whatever." So I sent him this book about Jesus. But you know, he wrote back that he was upset and he was touched by that book. And so we talk about those things now. And, uh, you know, he, he thanks me because I'm the only one who cares about him. And I don't even do much, really. All I did was I write him every once in a while and I send him money. But his father, I always tell him, your father should be strong. That doesn't sound very Christian. But if he doesn't <laughs> repent, the Lord is taking things down. <laughs> he will string him up when he returns. His son, all this stuff is like partly his fault.